My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Members to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I am talking with Kyle Sullivan, founder of Unleash the Champ. And we'll get into what Unleash the Champ is and how he came about um, founding that. Uh, prior to, to the foundation of Unleash the Champ, he worked as a pastor for 11 years. Prior to that, he um, did various things that we'll get into, but uh, really the beginning of this story uh, starts with him being a Division I athlete in, in college at Louisiana Monroe. Um, later, he would go on to uh, finish his degree work at, uh, at a university in Arkansas. Before we get into all of that, I, I always like to get a sense of um, my guests' life growing up, what their family life was like, what kind of sports they played, all that. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming on and, and agreeing to talk with me today, Kyle. Um, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell the audience a little bit about uh, your life growing up? I, I guess you grew up in Louisiana? Yeah, man. So super glad to be on here. And uh, yeah, so I grew up in Louisiana. I was born to my dad when he was a senior in high school. So my, I was... Yeah, my dad was 19 when I was born, about to graduate high school. And so growing up, you know, a baby, baby raising a baby. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so born, my dad was a senior in high school. My biological mom left when I was probably six or seven months old. And so it's just my dad and I, uh, to this day, my dad's the hardest working man I know. And uh, we could get in when we talk about the creation of the company, we can talk about the significance of that. Um, but grew up in, if your listeners have heard of Duck Dynasty, that's my hometown. So um, I can't grow a beard. Your listeners can't see that, but I can't grow a beard. Uh, I don't hunt. I don't fish. So I was really like a black sheep of that. But I grew up in a great town that was, you know, your you're nice, you have manners, you, you do good, and people will do good by you. It was a great place to be from. So much of my life, childhood growing up was revolved around sports. Um, I remember being five years old and, you know, getting on my first t-ball team and being, you know, second, third grade playing flag football. And so everything revolved around sports for me. I wasn't the kid that liked you know, trucks and cars and Legos. I didn't like that. Give me a ball and some grass and I could entertain myself all day long. And so just continued that. And through elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, played varsity uh, football, stopped playing baseball in high school because I wasn't exceptional at either sport. So I needed to have a singular focus <laughs> and, uh, but got into powerlifting in that uh, in high school in the off season of football. Cause I just thought, well, that'll make me stronger. And so through all of that, my life has been exemplified by me wanting to be accepted. And I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, that came from probably some things subconsciously of my mom, my biological mom leaving. And so, so much of decisions I made and so much of the things that I tried to do and be a part of was about me seeking validation and acceptance and and really that just feeling and sense of belonging so graduate high school go to college in my hometown because i was going to be friends with my high school buddies forever we all went to the same college um anybody that's 
more than two years removed from high school knows that that doesn't happen. But I thought it would, and my parents tried to tell me, you know, it wasn't going to be the case. But anyway, so tried to walk on, wanted to walk on the football team. That didn't work out. But the strength and conditioning coach was married to the cheerleading sponsor. And so through a series of events, I become a cheerleader in the this college that I went to. And it was a wild ride. It was what uh, challenged me more than any sport that I played because I'd never done anything like that. That also is what led me into the drugs. And all of it, again, was just that need for acceptance. And so I had this internal, like, maybe I shouldn't do that. But I just, I, I did. And it intensified. I loved it. Um, like some people have this story. I was like, oh my gosh, drugs ruined my life. And I did it. I wouldn't have said that in the moment. And it wasn't until I got jumped at a drug deal that I said, you know what? Maybe this isn't the life I want to live. And so reached out to a guy that I knew from church because what I failed to mention and all of that is in middle school and high school, I was going to church. And so I had these, I had these two separate lives that I lived with two separate friends. And I called the guy and I said, you know what? It's like two, three o'clock in the morning, Dave. And I said, I need effing Jesus. I just didn't abbreviate anything. He said, okay, fine, come over. I got led to Christ on the front porch of a guy's house in between drags of a cigarette. And I said, the next morning, what do I do now? And that just led me on this journey of really just putting my yes on the table of as opportunities come, I take the next right step, which led me to going back to school, to getting my degree, a small Christian college in Arkansas, Washtenaw Baptist, and went into ministry. Thought I was going to be in ministry for ever. Thought I was going to retire in ministry. Got the chance to work for three churches in that in that time. One was a part time about six months after college, and then I got to work for two of the most well known, well respected, sought after churches in America in that time of the ten and a half years. Got to lead, you know, thousands of people. All of that stuff. And then everything changed October 5th, 2019 at 1247 a.m. when I held my daughter for the first time. And it was in that moment that I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I wanted to give her and my family the, the gift of, of presence of time, not presence of things. Didn't know how it was going to be done. And then the pandemic hits. And I believe that with reflection, with disruption allows for reflection. And it, the idea of Unleash the Champ, I feel, was just downloaded to me. And so we, we launched it middle of last year and been going with it ever since. So you mentioned your daughter that, that, Kind of seems like she was the the catalyst um, for you to kind of look for something different than uh, ministry, and then yeah. um, you come up with unleash the champ. So now, what exactly is unleash the champ? Yeah. So unleash the champ is. I have two verticals. One, it's it revolves around personal and professional culture. So culture is what you tell, teach, and tolerate. That creates your culture. So do one-on-one -on -one coaching with individuals uh, and then organizational coaching around mission, vision, values, redefining or enhancing culture because that is what drives everything in our success is our personal and our professional culture. So those are the two verticals. And we go through your calling, the heart of your personal, personal or organizational life, 
your altitude, where do you want to ultimately go, your mindset, and then performance, because we can think about a lot of things, but if we don't take action, it doesn't matter. You, you began this in the middle of the pandemic, which yeah. um, gives you a little bit of time to develop. <laughs> right. Um, now, did you start it off as like a, a web-based uh, coaching type of Yeah, thing? so everything was built off of, you know, creating conversations uh, with people online. And so I was most active on Instagram. And so that's what I, I just started having conversations with people, seeing if I could help them. And it, it didn't have the organizational piece initially. It was just one to one personal coaching and just started that and through referrals through helping people get results that was the thing that made me go hold on I can't run from the fact that for the last 11 years I was helping create organizational culture and now this stuff is starting to open back up and people are having events again and people are having trainings again and and they're wanting to define or redefine what culture is going to be post pandemic, which I know we're not completely out of it, but anyway, what is it gonna be moving forward? It's a great time to position myself and our team as somebody that can come in and help with that personal and professional culture. Well, tell me a little bit about your organizational development as um as a pastor yeah so i got to work for two incredible churches that the focus was we're gonna run this thing like a business i need you to have the mind of a business guy gal but the heart of a pastor and so the church that i worked at for seven years uh we i mean now has 36 locations 11 states um massive footprint in the church world and so we would we would bring you know have quarterly hiring events where we're hiring new people on bringing them in training them giving them the mission the vision the values helping them assimilate into the culture helping with uh development of team members helping to develop interns um all things that i got to be a part of while running my own personal slice of ministry at a campus and being the the number two guy ultimately at a campus that was running you know for 4, 4,500 people uh, being able to do personality assessments and profile uh, strengths profiles things like that those were the things that I got to do in ministry um, and that's what I do now with it we're kind of backtracking a little bit Sure. Um, because I, I think we left out a lot on, you know, your own personal development, really what kind of took you to where you are now. Um, so when, when did you first start going to church? Yeah, so first started going to church when I was in eighth grade. So there was a big men's conference that was really big in the uh, 90s and early 2000s called Promise Keepers. And my dad was hounded by a guy at his job to go with him to this thing. And my dad fought it, fought it, fought it. Finally was like, hey, I'll go if you shut up about it. And so, okay, great. <laughs> you know, the guy got what he wanted. So my dad came back from that weekend and sat my mom and I down, who I know is my mom, was my stepmom and said hey this is what happened i went to this retreat i've accepted christ we're going to start going to church now mind you dave my whole world revolved around sports so i said when is that i had no context of church he said that's on sundays i said dad we're not going to church i said that's when we watch football and he said no, we're going to church. And as an eighth, as an eighth grader, you can assume who won that argument. So I started going to church. It wasn't until you got jumped during a drug deal that 
So, I mean, I'm sure you went to like Sunday school and that stuff. Oh right? man, I was, I was at every retreat. I was at every Wednesday night thing. I was at Sunday school, Sunday night school. I mean, we had, it, it I went, I mean, it was, so what, probably 13, 14 to 21. So I was in church every week for seven, eight years. And I couldn't stand it. It was the thing that I did because I was listening to my parents. And so a, a joke when I tell my story, you know, I had a drug problem before I had a drug problem because my parents drugged me to church. And it was, but it was that sitting in the environment that at the moment that it, it stopped not making sense, I reached out to the guy that I knew from church. When did you start playing sports? At what age did you start playing sports? Gosh. So I started playing T-ball at five years old and started playing football third grade so however old that is a lot of a lot of the individuals that i talk to on the show that have you know childhood experience in sports and that sort of thing um get a lot of leadership development in you know those team sports and um a lot of influence from the coaches that they've had and that sort of thing and 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 also from their parents. And so I was wondering, like what, um, you know, you watched your dad as you grew up working, what, what kind of um, work did your dad do? And so he dropped out, dropped out of high school and started driving a truck. So he was driving 18 wheelers, um, working in pipe yards, ultimately got to where he, Worked in oil and gas on rigs. Um, that's what he still does today. And so that was his primary job. But to be able to provide, he always had, I feel like he always had like four or five little side hustles um, just to make ends meet and, you know, to provide for me. And my dad's heart was, and he told me this often, like, I'm going to make sure that you have more opportunities than I had. And, you know, some of that was, well, because I was born when he was a senior in high school, he didn't get the chance to, you know, kind of cut his wings and, and, and fly and whatnot. But he always made sure that whatever I wanted, whatever I needed, and most of what I wanted always was taken care of. And what about your, your grandparents? Yeah, so... I had a good relationship with my grandparents. Um, they lived about 30 minutes. One, one set lived about 30 minutes away. The other lived about 45. So we saw them often growing up. Um, my dad remarried um, and married who I knew as my mom when I was three. And so the, you know, grandparents were, that's, that's all I knew as my mom and her parents. And so what, what about your maternal grandparents? Do you know them? No. I, no, man. I My biological mom could walk through my, my office right now and I wouldn't, I wouldn't recognize her. I don't know. Never had any contact with her. And, and you mentioned that that has, you know, has affected you a certain way. And do you still struggle? Do you feel like you still struggle with with some of that lingering um uh, uh, yeah man you know uh, i think i think I, i've done a lot of counseling around it and a lot of when it, when it comes up most is when there's big life moments and i have this thought of like hmm i wonder it it hit me more than i thought when i became a parent because yeah. Dave, I couldn't imagine, and I don't know the situation. I don't know the circumstances. I'm not. I'm not in their shoes. But you know, we have a. My daughter is 20 months old. Uh, my son, who was just born 
13 days ago, I, I couldn't imagine leaving them. And I don't know how life was at that time. She was also young. She was also in high school. Um, but yeah, man, it's a, uh, I think that there's always be a lingering of that. It's a huge piece of who I am. Um, and in those moments where I go, okay, it has definitely hit more. And I, I, I get to talk to my counselor often about it when I became a parent because before I came a parent it was just like you know hey yeah whatever it's just part of my story but when I became a parent that's when it hit differently because it's hard for me to imagine it's hard for me to imagine leaving them I'm guessing you probably came to the realization through counseling because I've I've done some counseling like not as a counselor, but I've gone through some counseling. And a lot of times you discover things or put pieces of the puzzle together that hadn't occurred to you before. But realizing that maybe some of your behaviors or even self-destructive behaviors growing up kind of link to those early experiences. Oh, 100%, man. So much of what I so much of what I did was to gain acceptance, to be liked, to be seen as valuable, and not to give too much power to my biological mom, but something in that was, was deposited because I had 50% of my DNA absent. And I just thought it was like, oh man, I, you know, I, I couldn't pinpoint it until I went and have done a lot of intensive work internally to go, huh, and now see the correlation. There's, um, so on, on my website, I've got a, a page that's dedicated to like mental health resources and then, you know, uh, personal, professional uh, growth resources, that sort of thing. But um, one of the things that I, I talk a lot about, and I've had quite a few guests on that are veterans and first responders and talk a little bit about PTSD and some of the stigma that surrounds that. But recently I had a conversation with Dr. Marissa Pei, who's out in um, Southern California. Um, she's like a morning show host out there, but I was having this conversation with her um, and, and we were talking about the ACE study. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's um, adverse childhood experiences. So one of the things that we had talked about and one of the things that a lot of people don't recognize is that it's a really, really high percentage of the population that has had adverse childhood experiences, you know, some form of trauma, whether it's abandonment, um, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, by th before the age of 18, one in four girls are sexually assaulted. Before the age of 18, one in six boys are sexually assaulted. And, you know, I've got, I've got a daughter. And to think about that, it's, uh -huh. uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that as a parent, you want to make sure that you protect your child as much as possible. But you know that when they get older, you're not always going to be there. So really, when, when I talk about leadership and, you know, especially with, when I talk with somebody that has children and you can put it in the context, when you're, when you're leading a team of people, one of the things that, that I, I talk about is, you know, when you, when you take that, take on that responsibility, when you take on that role, you're obligating yourself to ensure the success of the team. And 
It's not like if they mess up, oh, they're done, get rid of them. It's really caring about them to a level that you, you are going to hold them accountable for their actions, but you also want to prepare them for the future and develop them and develop yourself as well in order to add as much value to them as possible. And when you ap apply that to you know, thinking of being a parent, like when your kid messes up, you know, you're not going to just get rid of them. You're going to talk to them, try and help them learn a lesson from that. And hopefully they won't make that same mistake moving forward. But any kind of discipline that you give them is not out of like punishment for the sake of punishing them. It's you're, you're holding them accountable so that they can be better moving forward. And when we're working with a team, especially, you know, working with adults, it's, you know, you can't really think of them as a child because they're an adult, but you want to care for them as though they are your responsibility, you know? And 100%. So when, and this is such a, uh, a broad topic, you know, bringing in the ACE study, but when we think about, you know, any size team, if, if the team is, has any kind of diversity, um, you know, you're going to have a higher performing team most likely than one that's homogenous, but with that diversity comes a lot of different life's experiences. And sometimes without recognizing it, we look at people as, you know, they're, they're messed up or something because we don't consider what their life's experiences were like, what, what they've gone through. And, um, and a lot of times they, will never ever let anybody know because having those kind of experiences comes with some shame and not thinking that, you know, well, thinking that there isn't anybody else out there that knows what, I, what I've experienced or can relate to that. So, but the reality is, is that it's, it's close to 90% of adults, you know, have had some adverse childhood experience. And to me, that's just incredible. I had never heard those numbers, but they're like, those are actually legitimate statistics that just blow my mind where, you know, I spent a lot of my life believing that there is just such a small segment of the population that had ever had any bad stuff happen when they were growing up. You know? And I think most people want others to believe that they had a great life growing up because if you admit that you hadn't, there's something wrong with you. Right. Yeah. I think you, I think you bring up a lot of incredible things because we, the thing that isolates us most is when we think that we're the only one going through something. And I love the point that you just said, because when we admit that we've had trauma, then we have to admit that we, at some level, are broken. And that was my journey. I mean, I remember when my counselor said, have you dealt with the trauma that you've gone through? And I said, I haven't gone through any trauma. Uh, yes, you have. No, I haven't. I like literally was like a child. Uh-uh. No, I haven't. And, and I still struggle with calling it that. Because I think we do two things. We either try to isolate and say, like, we've never gone through anything. Or two, we minimize it. And I think that's honestly like where I'm at right now because I've walked with people through 
really dark, painful things. And so for me, I'm going, but I know this person, this person, this family, this thing, this, they're way worse. They've gone through way more than me. I would call that, but not this. And so that's where I'm currently at. And what I'm currently working through is acknowledging what that ACE study would say. Yeah, I'm part of that statistic, but I still have a hard time in my mind accepting that. Yeah, and, and that, I would say that most, it's probably more prevalent in, in men accepting that. Um, but there, there's a lot of women that would not define things that have happened to them as, as trauma as well. And, you know, and everybody deals with things differently. And that's kind of where I'm going with this is when you put it in the context of leadership and really trying to understand the people that you're leading and, it's, it's that emotional intelligence aspect of being empathetic and being able to communicate effectively to develop a, a trust where then maybe these people that you're leading might share with you. And if there is that kind of relationship that, that develops, the the level of achievement that that team can can realize is huge. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think if a leader doesn't take the time to get to know their people, they will forever be kept. And what we know about leadership is people don't leave organizations; they leave leaders. And so when a person says, "Oh, I'm I'm changing." I'm changing jobs, I'm changing careers, I'm changing whatever. If we know the person and they're open enough to share, it had nothing to do with the place they worked. It's who they worked for. It's who was leading them or not leading them. It's probably a better way to say. And so our ability to understand that when we bring in so many different people, the beauty is the diversity. I, when I first got into leadership, I wanted, I wanted a bunch of carbon copies of me because I thought, you know what? We're going to be drivers. We'll be hustlers. Type A, get done. We're going to be moving. And then I got married. And my wife is the exact opposite of me. And she helped me more than she probably will ever know in leadership. Because I was young in leadership, probably within my first couple of years, just starting to lead, you know, a few dozen people. And I would tell her, I'm going to say this and this and this and this is what they did. She's like, my God, Kyle, you sound like an a-hole. If you say that to them, they're going to quit. And I'm like, why? Like, I'm just acknowledging what they did and how they can get better. And so this empathy piece was something that was so hard for me because I was very much that like, just do what I do and you'll be successful. Well, yeah, if you're like me. I had some people that I really loved leading because they were, we were not related, but mindset wise and, and drive wise, we were, and it was always the, the most fun. But the things that were most needed for me were the people that were really empathetic, high feelers, high emotional intelligence in those uh, interpersonal relationships and that, that care piece that really challenged me the most to grow in my leadership is when I had to take the time to slow down and really get to know them and hear them and let them be heard. That's what grew me the most. And so I love the piece of empathy um, I have a buddy who he says, man, his goal in leadership is to have fierce empathy. I've, I've actually had quite a few guests on and we talk about this, this component. Um, 
you know, a lot of my background is in the fire service, which is, you know, male dominated occupation. And there, there's some good leaders in the fire service in North America, but man, is there a lot of bad ones and you can find it everywhere you go. It's not, you know, it's not just confined to the fire service, but one of the things that endures is that it's a very exclusive, you know, it, it's hard for women to come into the fire service and be treated the same as, as a guy, you know? And by that, what I mean is getting the same level of mentoring um, if they make a mistake, getting the same growth opportunities um, and not like, because typically if they, if a woman makes a mistake in the fire service, it's not because they're new or they didn't know how to do what they were trying to do. It's because they're a woman and they don't belong. So imagine like doing working in a career for 15, 20 years as a woman, okay? You have paid your dues. You're the most senior person on the truck, not just in time, but in rank. And you pull up on scene and it's not just the fire service. It's our culture in the United States when, you know, people automatically look to a man and an emergency and yep. oh man that would just freaking kill me if i experienced that i never had to experience that because well one i'm a white man there's a lot of things that i've never experienced you know and i can only imagine you know being a woman or you know being um african an african-american man or uh even a Hispanic male in a predominantly white area where, you know, you're, it, that would just drive me nuts. Cause I know it happens. Cause I've, I've seen it happen where the officer in charge is, you know, brown skin, whether they're Hispanic or African American, they're, they're looked past and where's the white guy at? Because that's who I want to talk to. And that's some crap, man. Yeah, 100%. So I, I think in, in organizational culture, some of that, if, if that is present, it needs to be addressed because first off, if you are the white guy on the truck that people are going to, there needs to be some courage on your part to say, hold on a second. This is, this is the guy in charge. This is who you want to talk to. Absolutely. Um, or this is the woman in charge. This is who you want to talk to, or this is, this is my officer. This is who is going to take you to the finish line. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and show that respect and deferral. And you know, it, it's tough, it, especially in male dominated organizations, because there is a lot of ego when you get so much testosterone together. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and some of that, that same deal was in ministry with women being in leadership. Well, that's kind of why I brought this up. Yeah. Because how does that translate in the church when, I mean, I, I grew up in the church and it was always told that women are supposed to be subservient to men. Mm. I mean. Right. So that scripture that's talking about is wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, most of our culture incorrectly only uses the first half of that verse 
And when we think through the context of what Christ did for the church, us, the people, not the building, he died. And so, you know, people for years, I mean, that's, people would use that tagline to suppress women being able to get in leadership roles of the church. I mean, what I always found interesting is you would let a woman, you'd let a woman be in the kids ministry. Oh yeah, you can lead all day long with the children. Right. But oh, you get on stage and actually like share and preach and teach. Mm -mm. No, you can't do that. And I could say in my ministry career, some of the greatest leaders I worked for were women that were leading massive things. But it took years to get there. And even still, what you're saying about what would happen on a truck would happen with us in ministry. And we would have to do exactly what you said. Like, like hey, you know what? I believe in the leadership of fill in the blank person. If you have a question, you need to go to them. I know you, I know you would prefer to talk to me. Let's the three of us go and have that conversation. And it really was, you know, talk about culture. It's correcting that culture. It's being that CRO, that chief reminding officer of like, hey, listen, that person is our leader. That person is the one leading the charge. That person is the one preaching, teaching, leading, however, you know, whatever it is, whatever context. But it was a struggle. I remember, I remember when we were in a location and there was a guy who was the, the, the lead pastor of our location, not of the whole church, but he left and went somewhere and we had a woman come in and Dave, you would have thought we were trying to have Satan lead our campus <laughs> to some people, yeah. to yeah. some people, because it was so foreign. And part of me realizes that people judge what they don't understand. And so I don't get upset when people have an initial reaction to something that is new in this conversation, women in leadership of whatever industry. But what I do have a problem with is when people just wanna sit in their ignorance and not have the conversation of, well, why can't this person do this? And I mean, you mentioned you have a daughter. I do as well. My friends joke that I became like a little like male feminist when I had a daughter because I'm like, tell me my daughter can't do something. Yeah. <laughs> Please tell me. Like I'm from Louisiana. I can get like this mix between Medea and Donkey from Shrek real quick. Like <laughs> where it's like my voice gets high and I'm like, you, oh, you want to go? Tell me Piper Grace Sullivan can't do something. Yeah. But it was all built upon like, there's like, there are things that we will have to talk to our daughters about and say, listen, you're going to work, you're going to have to work twice as hard. You're going to have to have twice as few, you're going to have to have half the mistakes of somebody beside you. That is not, does not look like you built like you have the anatomy of you. Like it just is. And now that I have a son, I'm going to have to say like, hey, your brother's going to have opportunities that you will have to work twice as hard for. It just is what it is. And hopefully, you know, got 20 months, two years old and two weeks old, maybe in another, you know, 20 years when they're out the nest. <laughs> Maybe the world will look different, but I think there will still be pieces of this because you can't you can't turn the Titanic of society with and make it a complete overhaul. Right. And yeah, it I, I think it so I, I have one child, I have a daughter, and I always felt like if I did have a son. It would, uh, it would be my responsibility to raise him in such a way that he enlightens other men to the value of women. 
because it's a lot easier for, you know, one of the same group to change the minds of that group than an outsider to come in and change the minds of that group. So that's, I think, part of the responsibility of parents of boys is to really raise them with that mindset and, and, you know, unfortunately there are parents of boys that only have boys and, you know, and their, and their mindset is we got to keep these, you know, little harlots away from my princes. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but if, uh, Yeah, I, I just, one of the things that you said about some of the best leaders that you've had have been women, and it's it's all about the opportunity. And, and one of the things that I want to say, I either read it or uh, one of my guests informed me, or both, I don't remember which, but um, that typically when women are going for a promotion, they are overqualified for that promotion before they even consider going for it. Mm, that, and, that's wild. And, that makes and, sense though. But it, part of that is that we um, really work with, with our boys to get their confidence up, you know, don't be afraid to try, you know, get yourself out there, get in the game. And with our girls, we're very protective. And some of that can lead to a lack of confidence in their own personal abilities. So man, I, I picked up on that early on. Um, not, and I don't think it was like some great, uh, epiphany that I had. I think, um, uh, a woman in my life, whether it's a friend or somebody that I worked with, or maybe, um, maybe it was my ex-wife. I, I don't remember exactly, but it was one of those moments where I'm like, I definitely do not want my daughter growing up thinking that she can't do something and being afraid to try, even though it could be something that she's never done before. And there's a good chance that she'll fail. But man, like think about all the times that you've fallen on your face, the valuable lessons that you've learned and how you've been able to come back stronger because of that experience. 100%, 100%. Our, our life is built on failures and setbacks being the, the, the stepping stones to success. I mean, when we win, it's like, nah, okay, whatever. But it's in those setbacks. It's in those, that really is the setup for success. So 100%, man, I, I, I look at, I look at my daughter and some of the things that she I'm incredibly mindful as well of like trying not to be that protective, like, no, 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 no. Yeah. You know, she's standing up on a toy and I'm like, in my head, I'm going, I could get her down. <laughs> or, you know, it's only like four inches off the ground. Like, she's not going to hurt herself when she falls. She's just not going to like when she hits the ground. Okay, let's see what happens. Now that has backfired a bit because then she's like, "Oh, I can stack stuff up." Like my daughter, <laughs> my daughter has no fear, um, and I'm trying to appropriately manage that. Um, but yeah, man, I totally get that. So applying that mindset to how we manage, lead, and mentor women that are coming into our organizations. And having that understanding that many of the women coming into our workforce or onto our team are going to be hesitant to 
to to put themselves out there and i i think the importance well especially in male dominated organizations the importance of male mentors for women is huge and clearly to to be able to do that the the men have to have some very clear boundaries um so that things aren't misconstrued and that sort of thing um because that can devolve rather quickly but the importance of you know like really leading them and showing them like look don't be afraid to fail you know if you fail you'll know better next time and i want you to try things if you think it's going to work you know maybe starting off 50% of the time you're going to fall on your face the other 50 you're going to succeed but what's going to happen is over time that ratio is going to improve and before long it'll be 95% success rate and very small uh, percentage of failures and those failures will be so minuscule that nobody will even recognize it as such it'll just right. be you know an just be a thing yep. yeah we've talked a little bit about unleash the champ and i i kind of want to get a better understanding because it was kind of surface level what how you described what you're doing so maybe dig down a little bit deeper and and what is what is driving um unleash the champ what sets you apart and you know what would you say you're the best at yeah yeah it definitely was a high high flyover um in the beginning of this conversation so we'll take the organizational piece so typically the question that I ask that gets the conversation going with executives, CEOs, people at the management table is, do you wish your people cared about this place as much as you do? And they go, go ahead. <laughs> do you feel like your people embody the culture, the mission, the vision, the values that you set at the foundation of this place. Go ahead. Okay. Those are two big, big things. Then go, do you feel like your teams are more so siloed, kind of doing their own thing with maybe an, a, a, an in, imbalanced um, amount of autonomy? Or are they united, really synergistic in their execution of objectives and things that y'all champion? That's probably on the other side. Yeah. So what I do is I'll go in and I'll ask, I'll have interviews and I'll talk with everybody at a, the executive level, get feedback, questions, fresh eyes assessment is what I, I call it. And it's just a series of questions because I'm not emotionally attached to this place. And then I'll go a level down and a level down. Typically, I don't go, you know, if they have hundreds of employees, I'm not interviewing everybody. We'll start small and build. But then I, I present, hey, here's where I think you're going. You're, you're freaking crushing it. This is a consistent. This was language that was used. These are the things. Here's some stuff that, you know, not, not a red flag, not something that's a, a hole in the ship, but there's a crack and it needs to be examined. Here's some, some cannonball size holes. It's either what was said, what was not said, or a feeling that I felt, hey, I need to ask more questions to the leadership team because I'm getting a sense that it may be fill in the blank. And so then we create, okay, based on these three to five pain points or opportunities. Here's what we're going to do to improve that. And we'll set it up on, you know, one goal will be 90 days. We're really going to focus on that. So if it's 
hey, your people, after about the, the management level, they don't understand the culture. Okay, so what can we do? We can, we can do some ways to implement the culture further down into the organization so that it's actually on the hearts, not just on the walls or in the handbook. And if it's, hey, our people really, one of the opportunities is they wish that they would be developed more. Well, I'm certified in Myers-Briggs, EQI, Strength Finder, a myriad of, of personal development tools. Okay, cool, which one do you wanna use? And I can train you and your team on how to use those and use them to understand each other, which creates that synergy and that empathy and the connection, collaboration, all those things. So that's the big piece of what I do with organizations. With personal, it's people that have solved the money problem. I'm not trying to help anybody grow their bank account. These people typically have, but the question I ask them is, at what sacrifice? Because typically, people that have a lot of success professionally have forgotten about the other three quadrants that are important, their personal life, their relational life, and their emotional life, mindset, mental health. And so I'll work with folks and say, hey, do you wish that do you wish that you could have a greater connection personally, relationally, emotionally, and professionally? Helping people prep, as I call it, prep for success. So in that, it's way more fluid. It's not as structured as the organizational piece. But with the individuals, it's going, okay, hey, look, there's something not working. There's something you've sacrificed that you want to get back. I can help you do that. So a lot of times on the personal side, people are investing in accountability. They're investing in someone that, again, is not emotionally tied to their situation, but can help them see things that they couldn't otherwise see that aren't deep enough and, and painful enough that they need to go to counseling. Yeah. Because there's times where I go, Hey, you know what? Where are you at? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me find a counselor in your area. Where counseling looks at the past, I'm looking at the present and the future. That's awesome, man. Now, one thing that I that I always ask, because you know, I, I want to make sure that we don't leave anything unsaid especially something important so we've we've talked about a lot of stuff and uh I'm, I'm just wondering is there anything that we didn't touch on that you feel is very important for the listeners to hear and um you know i'm gonna i'm gonna also i'd like you to mention your website and i'll put your website in the show notes um but yeah, is there anything that you think we should talk about before we go? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So you can find me online. Website is kylejsullivan.com. It's super easy. I'm most active. If you're a social media person, uh, most active on Instagram at kylejsullivan. You can email me, kyle at kylejsullivan.com. I'm real easy to get a hold of. Uh, I think the thing that I'm learning most, that I, my clients are learning most, either personally or professionally, is we are in a season where so many of us have decisions to make. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should we push into this new initiative? Should we not? Should I make a jump and go into this career or should I not? So we have a lot of this worry, this anxiety, when really like organizations and people are wanting peace now more than ever peace about a decision, peace about a direction, peace about purpose. And what I'm telling them is my own story is that peace follows our obedience to take the next right step. It rarely precedes it. So listeners, if you're struggling, should I do this, should I not? Organizations, and should we, should we, bring this thing back should we not make a decision even a wrong decision made 
is better than a right decision thought about. So know that the peace that you're looking for will come after your obedience and action. It will rarely, if ever, proceed it. Thank you so much for, for sharing so much with me and, uh, and the listeners and really a great conversation. It was not exactly what I was expecting, you know, to, to think you know, we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to talk with a pastor that was a division one cheerleader that turned into a drug dealer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is uh, this has been really cool. Uh, I really appreciate you, you sharing and and um, man, clearly you've got a, a command on the leadership and and the coaching and uh, I mean, great insight, a lot of tools at your disposal. Um, I really hope that that the show helps uh, get your name out there because man, uh, yeah, more power to you, brother. Absolutely. Thank you. It, uh, I will say that this interview, this episode has pulled more out. Um, so your questions um, pulled more out of the, the skeletons in the closet, if you will. Um, and so I really enjoyed this. It, it, it was, I get to be on a lot of podcasts and I just want you to know this is probably the most conversational and the most fluid um, of that I've been on probably ever. So it was really an honor, man, to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.